So this is our second last webinar now, and we're on the key of life and have Nick Macy and Richard Orr join us today. So um, before we get into the session, I just want to pay my respects to the first people of this nation, um, Australia, because we have people from all over Australia, so the indigenous people, um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, today, the way that we, I've had a kind of brief check in with Richard around um, the session and we're going to kind of pretty much follow the same format because there's a few of us, we'll do a bit of a check in and then we'll hand over to Richard and Nick and I know that they're quite keen to have some discussion rather than um, the whole time presentation. So um, yeah, we'll see how that goes and hopefully more people will join us as we go. So. Steve, did you do a bit of a check-in? Did you kind of say a bit about who you were to Nick and Richard before? Because I had to go off, so I just want to check. Yes, I did, so, yeah. You did, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, Bridget, are you happy to check in? So Bridget isn't called Robin, Zuby. She's called Bridget. Hello, um, hi, I think I've um, said hello before to you, Nick, and one of these as well. Um, uh, my name is Bridget Scott. I'm the training manager at CAMCAN, which is a disability support organisation in Western Australia. Probably my um, other bit that I don't ever mention is that I'm an OT by trade. So I'm kind of, I think I remember watching Nick a very long time ago when you were at the beginning of Befriend um, at an LAC conference or something like that. So um, yeah, that's me. Okay, cool. Um, Bev, are you, have you, are you there or have you gone? So somebody's just joined us called iPhone and I have a feeling that may be Alex. Hi, hi, it's Silvana. Hello, Silvana. We can hear you, but we can't see you. I, I'm just trying to uh, negotiate that. Okay, no problem. Um, if it helps, the video button is down on the left corner. Hello. Nice it's, to see you. It's just I'm sorry I'm late. The first no day, problem. end of Ramadan, so I couldn't resist, so I'm nibbling. I'm sorry about that. No problem. Nice to see you. Um, and so Savannah, and we're just checking in. Hi, Bev, you're back. Um, Steve's gone, so, you, so the people who are already on the call will know that Steve, they'll know Bridget, who's pretending to be Robin Zuby, but that's Bridget there. Um, Bev, are you happy to check in? Yeah, sure, sorry, I just had some technical issues. I just froze up there. So um, I'm Bev, and um, I work for Avivo and um, do some admin work with Waze. And uh, yeah, really happy to be on this webinar series. Very interesting. Thanks, Bev. Anik? Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm a few. It's just the thing that I was at my desk, like all busy with work, and then I realized this. So, really happy to be here and to um, listen to, the, to, to participate in this um, awesome seminar i'm really really excited at the idea of um this whole series i am interested in part in building capacity and capabilities through participation and citizenship is definitely a um, the golden way to participation so this is me today i'm calling in from new zealand we have a sunny day thanks anik silvana um, Silvana, I'm mum of Karim, who's 28, self-managing since 2009. The last, I've missed two webinars and the one before that, hmm, I think you'll remember if you were there, I burst into tears and I was quite distressed and distraught. distraught. I'm still trying to process all of that and do something constructive with it. Um, it's not off my radar. Um, I've, been, I've been talking to a few people and figuring out what to do there to improve our system here and make it more citizenship focused. And um, Anik and I work together on building family capacity of very little children. And one really important thing that this webinar series um, has, has done is really highlight how we can incorporate the concept of citizenship more strongly for parents of little children. I'm happy to say that we've, um, we're, we're, we're just here in Sydney incubating two parent-led organisations and setting up their constitutions. and. Without this webinar series, I don't think we would have come to the conclusion that 
we're going to put into the objects of the constitution that citizenship is the citizenship model is the foundation um, for the two organisations. I think that's really I think that's really exciting and something practical that that um, participating has really um, done for us. So thank you everybody and whoever organised this series. It's been awesome. Fabulous. Thanks, Silvana. So we've got Nick, who's actually a regular amongst us, um, who's been on many of the calls, not all of them. But Nick, are you happy to check in? Sure. Hello. Um, yes, I did miss the last couple, but managed to catch up on mine. So very thankful for the recording. Um, and thankful to be here today. Um, my check-in is uh, been feeling a little bit crappy and run down the last couple of days. So thankfully, I can keep my germs behind the screen and I can hug this one. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to having conversations here about uh, noticing about the contributes within the community. And yeah, how, how do we make that possible for everybody? Cool, thanks, Nick. And then we'll have Richard Orr join us. So Richard, are you happy to check in? Sure, happy to check in, happy to be here. Thanks very much for the opportunity to chat to you all today. Um, as you can see, my name is Richard. I work for an organization called Inclusion WA. And Inclusion WA is part of a group of organizations that are focused on social inclusion, really. We work alongside people on a one-to-one -one basis to help them um, live a life of their choosing. And um, we also work alongside community groups. So that might include local government, state sporting associations, um, or local sports clubs, uh, music groups, arts, whatever it happens to be, to try and help them build their capacity to be more welcoming to people from all different walks of life, really. So we've morphed into a group structure because our Inclusion WA arm, which was the parent uh, company, and now work solely alongside people on a one-to-one -one basis. And we have a sister company called Inclusion Solutions that does our um, community development work. So, um, um, yeah, I guess I can give a perspective of a practitioner of our journey over the last uh, seven or so years around some of the practical uh, steps that we've taken to, um, to do whatever it takes to be as useful as possible in people's lives, really. So I'm looking forward to today and really grateful to be here. Thanks, Richard. Um, okay, so who am I handing over to first then? So we've got Nick and Richard who are joining us um, for to lead the session around life. So Nick, you'll go first. Cool, okay, I'll hand over to you then. It's actually really nice that I get to kind of co-host this with Richard because um, I was re reflecting on when we first met and that was about five years ago and it was at uh, a little community event where I was hanging out on a beanbag at some little stall trying to rope people into volunteering to take some sort of action to connect people in their local community. Um, so that was, that was yeah, where we first met and so it's, it's a nice little touch point. I think that we're here talking about that very topic today. Um, where we're gonna, it, it's also nice that we work in two quite different contexts too. So I think there'll be some themes of relatedness that will come through. Um, I'll talk a little bit more from the community development perspective, the citizen-led action perspective, um, and then hand over to Richard to talk more. Um, he's, he's expressed to me that he's keen to talk a little bit more around um, the, the service design for supporting people to live as active citizens. Um, I've got some I'll mute. Hello, Jacqueline. Sorry, sorry, Nick. Um, uh, hello, Jacqueline, you've just joined us, but I've muted you, just in case you're wondering why we can't hear you. If you want to talk to us, just take the mute off. But Nick's just started, um, so send me a message if I can help. Um, I'll hand back over to you, Nick. Thank you, thank you. Cool. Um, All right, is that are those slides coming through all right? Yeah. Cool. So I guess in the, in the spirit of contribution and reciprocity, uh, Richard and I decided that we had, we, we did want this to be um, more of a, 
a two-way give and take and exchange of perspectives on this topic. So um, we thought that maybe we could take the lead with putting forward a bit of a focus question that we could start with sharing our perspectives on. And then maybe this is the question that we can come back to after we both shared um, to focus our discussion a little bit. So this, this question that we're really curious about is how could we work differently with people and communities to assist people to live and participate um, as active citizens? Um, and as I just mentioned, I'm gonna have a go at um, talking a little bit to my experiences from the, the citizen-led action perspective. Um, now, I'm no, no theorist or philosopher myself, be pretty clear about that, but um, I, yeah, I'm definitely more the pragmatist, but I'm going to kind of reference a couple of the, the people and the philosophies that have been really helpful for me with my thinking around this, um, but I'm going to focus more of my sort of perspective on just what my lived experiences have been and how we tried to apply some of these ideas in practice. Um, I thought that um, asset-based community development would be a good starting point on this topic and because it's one of the most helpful philosophies that I've come across in guiding my thinking about uh, this call to be active citizens in our local communities. Um, so Cormac Russell um, and he published this piece with John McKnight through the Asset-Based Community Development Institute late last year and came across it recently and they make very clear that the primary goal of asset-based community development is enhancing collective citizen visioning and production. So it's this notion of uh, really what, what future do we want for our society and, and what part are we going to play in bringing that future into being. He talks about these, uh, these, these seven responsibilities of our neighbourhoods um, and the necessity for citizens to be filling, fulfilling these responsibilities, that institutions and government are really almost the fallback to this when, when uh, community capacity kind of reaches its point of limitation. Um, so really questioning how do we kind of tap into the power of citizens to act to uphold these responsibilities through the actions that they take collectively. Now that can sound pretty big, but the, I think these, these three powers that they talk about uh, that enable us to fulfill our community functions help to try to ground this a little bit more in um, the powers that are inherent within each person. This notion of giving our gifts, uh, the power of association and groups and organisations um, and the power of hospitality. But for me in maybe more language that I connect with a little bit more strongly is this notion of sharing that something matters, sharing something that matters to us. That's to me what giving our gifts is. It's contributing something that matters to us um, different from our strengths, so not necessarily the things that we're good at, but the things that are really grounded in what we value and hold some sort of personal meaning or significance for us. The power of association, to me, this is just uh, simply about how we gather with others in groups, clubs, mm -hmm. workplaces, these contexts where we give our gifts to others and, and receive their gifts in return. Um, these are, the, these are the, the, the contexts in which our gifts can become amplified, magnified um, and really celebrated through connection with, it, with others. Um, and th these are the structures that act as peer-to-peer -peer support, um, building our confidence for the contributions that we are capable of making. Uh, they're also the structures that give this sort of rhythm and routine to the way that we participate with others. Um, and channel our collective, collective gifts towards a shared purpose. And I think that this, this third one around hospitality, to me, this is this notion about, around being radically welcoming. So not just having an open door and saying, all are welcome, this is, this is for all of us, um, but it's a, even a, a step further than that. It's how we apply intention to really thinking about who are the people that may not be present in this room and what might it look like for us to go that step further to building relationships, um, extending invitations and really radically welcoming people into these spaces where we take action together. So to me, those, sort of those three things together are really what creates this sort of foundation or a, a culture of community. Um, it's, I think it's also useful to kind of look, take a moment to, to consider what the opposite of that is sharing something that matters to us in groups with others while being radically welcoming. I think the opposite of each of those three, for that this first one, 
the word that comes up for me, I don't know if it's an actual word, but it's, um, it's unknowing. It's this sense of maybe when we haven't been nurtured to discover and connect with who we are and what really matters to us deeply, um, what our unique gifts are that it would, that would really fulfill us more deeply um, when we have the opportunity to share them. Uh, the opposite of being in groups with others is being in isolation, physically and socially. Uh, which deprives us of the opportunity to contribute. We can't contribute in isolation um, and we can very easily internalise this sense of our gifts not being of value or worth. And the opposite of, to me, of radically welcoming is, is excluding. Uh, if, we, if we are made to feel unwelcome based on who we are, um, be, it, be it through discrimina discrimination, marginalisation, whether it's through relationships or social structures um, or barriers that... Uh, you know, perhaps put down with good intentions to inherently keep us safe. But if we're excluded, then we are excluded from this culture of community. Um, so those, those three kind of barriers, unknowing, isolation and exclusion, um, to me, that's, that they together make up the experience of not belonging. And I think when we're really thinking deeply about this experience of not belonging um, and its opposite, I think the the antidote to not belonging is this culture of community. So to me, it's, I've been really curious about this question of what does it take to really nurture that culture of community? Um, so Befriend is an organization that emerged um, really out of our personal and professional experiences of not belonging. Um, that was about nine years ago now. Our purpose hasn't really wavered. It's really been centered around this notion of nurturing communities of connection and belonging for everyone. But the way in which we go about fulfilling that purpose has evolved over time. Uh, and it's really evolved because we've been really deeply intent on continuing to question what does it take to nurture that sense of connection and belonging for people. And one of the most important things that we've learned is that this sense of connection and belonging comes about when we are our unique self and we are appreciated accepted, valued, loved, exactly as we are. And that sense of appreciation so often comes about through this notion of contributing our unique gifts. And I think that that, that word contribution can sound like quite an active one, um, but um, a friend of mine, Janet Cleese, helped me sort of tease apart that a little bit more by making this distinction between making a contribution and being a contribution that we can make a contribution through the actions that we take, but we can be a contribution simply through the way that we are present with others. And I think that, that you know, in a culture that so, that so values action, sometimes that notion of being a contribution is one that we don't appreciate quite as much. But I think we all know from our personal experiences that there are so many people that we have in our lives that we appreciate just when they're there, this sense of presence that they create when we're spending time with them. So to me, that notion of making or being contribution, it's really about the imprint that we leave on others that matters to us both. Um, so that then this sense of this question around how we fulfill our purpose as an organisation has really um, evolved to, to in include supporting citizens to share their gifts and passions um, through connecting people in local communities around the things that matter to them. Um, I think that one of the... One of the use words I was reflecting to look at that is that it's almost like we are we are helping to build that on ramp into community contribution, um, and I think that that really appreciates that there are countless people who every day are fulfilling um, those responsibilities of neighbourhoods that Cormac mentioned. It's really not undermining their contributions at all, but to say how can we build a bigger groundswell of support around that, and how can we welcome and build up the capacity of more people to be doing more of that. Um, so for us, it's really been about making contribution to community simple, accessible, fun, flexible, uh, personally meaningful and social. So that it's something that we, we can really in, all inherently tap into our innate desire to be part of that movement. Um, and that's, for us, that's really bringing asset-based community development to life in a way that makes sense to people. These... Um, as I kind of reflected on the different, almost the, the key ingredients of that, I think that these, these five principles are really what um, 
underpin our approach. Um, and there's real power and impact in each of these. Uh, this discovery is really starting with gifts and capacity for contributions. Um, the belief that all people have something meaningful to contribute, um, whilst also appreciating that they might not know exactly what that is straight up. Uh, it's been really helpful to tease apart this differentiation between gifts and strengths, between the things that we're good at and the things that are inherently meaningful to us, the things that matter to us, that we love, um, that really drive us um, in our interactions with others. And, and that leads into this, this, this second principle of posing the challenge. So what would it actually look like to take action through those gifts in your community? Um, I love the um, work of Peter Block um, and his, the, one of the things that I've sort of recorded around the way he looks at per, this sense of personal accountability within citizenship um, is that he says authentic citizenship is to hold ourselves accountable for the well-being of the community and to choose to own and exercise power uh, rather than defer or delegate it to others. So to me, that's really saying that we all have this personal responsibility for the type of community that we want to live in. Uh, and that responsibility goes beyond telling others what we think they should do um, and calling us to act through our gifts. It requires us to step forward um, and, and really be curious about uh, like if, if the answers to our problems within our neighbourhood lie within this room, then what does that mean for the way that we need to act? This third one is around connection, um, contributing together. Um, we know that we can't do it alone and we know how important it is to be convening a platform for people to form connections with others, to find people to collaborate with, their co-conspirators, to form local teams. Um, it really build, really so much is around building confidence for taking action. Um, and we do that with each other. This, this next one here is, is around the power of the invitation um, and extending these, un, what we might call unusual invitations. So thinking about the people who would really appreciate this invitation who might not receive it otherwise. And the fifth principle here is solidarity. This is a word that's become really important to me that I think goes beyond the sort of notions of inclusion and that that are saying something inherently about difference and, and different groups of people. So saying something a little bit differently about this is about all of us. Uh, it's connecting with that shared humanness, um, seeing ourselves as part of the picture, seeing ourselves within others, uh, going beyond the structures that silo and segregate us, divide us. Um, and so I guess what that, I've kind of got a few little slides to just kind of briefly show what those principles have looked like in action for us. So, because I appreciate that that can all sound a little bit abstract. Um, but if we kind of imagine this picture to be um, people who live in a, a, a locality, then we kind of start with this community builder character, someone who's really going to take a, you know, a, a larger degree of responsibility for uh, bringing these principles to life. Uh, that person starts conversations with others, um, people who might also express that they have some sort of... Uh, desire to bring about change in their community and the types of conversations that they have uh, really start with these this set of activating questions which um, really starts to uh, uh, bring to life the power and impact of those principles uh, these questions around what you what you love to do what really matters to you uh, and then what what it would look like for you to share that with a group of others and how might you extend invitation and hospitality I think we can start to see those principles coming through in this style of questioning. So the, the discovery comes through in these questions around what we love and what matters to us. Um, the challenge, um, almost really quite subtly, that notion of personal accountability is coming through in asking what would it look like for you to share that with a group of others? Not what, do you, what would you like that to look like if someone else is taking that action, but what would it look like for you to share that with a group of others? And the connection in there is saying that although the, this kind of personal accountability is inherently being placed on you, that you don't have to do that alone, that you will be with others through that experience. And this, this notion of the invitation coming through, um, you know, and I, with the way that we sort of, we have, we find it really helpful to have conversations with residents about extending the invitation is when we talk about an experience of social isolation and how, there's no one organization or institution um, that can really 
end social isolation, uh, the only way that we really stand a chance is if all of us are thinking quite intentionally about who are the people who might be around us in our everyday life uh, who might be missing out and what might it look like for each of us to be extending that invitation. Uh, there's so much power in that notion of extending the invitation. And, and I guess that's what starts to lead to little semblances of action. Um, people doing these things, doing them with others in groups um, and doing that as, a, as part of a bigger network. I think what's, what I kind of didn't mention in that um, is around support. Um, and that's really because it's almost, it's really the last question in that set, um, if at all, like what support might you need to bring that to life? Uh, and the positioning of that question is really critical too, because it's, I think so often we start with that question rather than that being the last question. Um, and uh, I think when we position it as the first question really undermines the power and capacity of citizens to contribute and act together. Uh, so just sharing a couple of little examples of that sort of this, this is a nice little recent one that's sort of sprung up re, um, in the Vincent area in Perth. Uh, this is the Vincent Community Kitchen. So it's a group of local residents that are really passionate about the food system, um, sustainability, uh, this sense of, kind of building a culture of community, uh, minimizing waste, uh, cooking together, sharing experiences together. And so they, they kind of do the rounds um, on a monthly basis to a bunch of local restaurants and cafes and collect uh, and markets, collect a lot of um, sort of leftover sort of seconds produce uh, and have a get together at, uh, uh, at the North Perth Town Hall um, on the, I think it's the last Sunday of every month or set maybe second Sunday. And they have like almost like two sessions to it. They have the cooking session and the eating session. So you can come along um, and cook for a couple of hours to kind of cook up all that produce together. Um, and then you can stay and eat it, or you can just come for the, just come for the meal. You can just come for the cooking. Um, very open, very fluid, very flexible. Um, the, this group of residents in the Armadale area um, have been, uh, it's a crochet knitting group. So they've been knitting lots of like little winter warmers for families. Um, and apparently making themselves a bit of a nuisance at the library um, in the best possible way. Um, but then when they were thinking about a different way to really kind of share the stuff that they were creating, um, they kind of, uh, they realized that so much of their, uh, what they wanted to bring into being was really around joy and color. And so they kind of keyed into a local, um, uh, this is the Joel Street Mall activation event that was happening and looked at kind of how they can kind of contribute um, as, a, as a group to that effort as well. Uh, these are the, this is the singing ukes as they call themselves. So a bunch of people in the Kwinana area that play ukuleles. Um, I had no idea how many people play ukuleles, but apparently there's a lot of them. This group gets kind of about 25, 30 people um, rocking up each time. Um, heaps of them are beginners though, or have actually never played before. So they've got about four or five spares. So there's always people there to kind of teach people who haven't played before, uh, make it really accessible just to try something different. Uh, and there's people that kind of contribute to this group in all kinds of little ways through the, the food that they bring along or the way that they want to welcome and greet people at the door, um, the way that they maintain the space. Um, Whenever I think of um, like joy and humor, I think of these guys. I had to include that this little ukulele meme up the top because uh, in the Facebook group that the, these guys use to keep themselves connected, every week there's some ridiculous meme about ukuleles. I had no idea how many memes were out there. Apparently there's this huge community of ukulele lovers. Um, but yeah, just these little actions are bringing joy and laughter to people in their everyday. And, and another one that's just like a little bit of a different example. Um, this is from Tom. So he's, uh, he hosts through this network too. Um, and he attends lots of, lots of these gatherings. Um, but he's an aspiring photographer. And he thought that um, a way that he would really like to contribute would be to explore the values of community um, and of this community um, through the lens of photography. So he's... Uh, now in the process of creating this photographic series of um, these values of, so top left, you've got sustainability, and then bottom left is curiosity, top right is authenticity, fun, um, and inclusivity. So he's looking at how he can help people to connect to these values of community through creating images around them. And that's, yeah, it really helped me to take a little bit of a step back and not to, 
or to come back this come back to this notion of contribution or, and this idea of making a contribution and being a contribution that I think you know even myself I will often get a bit uh, excited probably excited is probably the best word by people that are making a contribution um, but often neglect to really appreciate this notion of being a contribution um, that it's not just the organizers um, within this sort of network, but it's all of the people that show up, that welcome people, uh, that you know, that offer practical help on the day, that are creating the space um, for patience and presence just in who they are. Um, the people that offer encouragement, uh, that know your name, that'll give you a hug, uh, that sit with you if you had a bit of a crap day. Um, all of these different ways that people are with others, um, that all, and that all matters. So we don't actually really know how many experiences have happened through this network in the last nine years, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, our estimate is that it's around about 5,000, but I think one of the really great things about engaging people in bringing these types of principles to life is that uh, you kind of energize and activate people as citizens to take action, and then they just sort of run away and it takes on a bit of a life of its own. And there's so much that sort of happens that's beyond um, anything that's really organized or institutionalized in the sense of sort of planned and structured, but it's really about these everyday actions that people are taking um, to, to be active citizens um, in their community. Um, a little cheesy finish note. Um, I, this, yeah, this is really cheesy, but to me, this it actually sort of sums up so much about what it means to be an active citizen. It's, uh, you know, this notion of acting for something bigger than ourselves, uh, it's doing it together uh, and it's taking the personal accountability for that. I think that's enough for me and I don't want to chew up too much more time. So I'm going to flick over to Richard now. Thanks, Nick. Um, I guess I wanted to start by just uh, quickly acknowledging the great work that the friends, yourself and the team do. A number of people that Inclusion WA support have tapped into some of those groups that you don't know about. And um, I just, uh, one of the things for me was the way in which BeFriend has been um, a spark for recognising those real community connectors among us to take action and bring people together through shared and common interests. The, the impact that you've had is way beyond the organization. And I think that's an idea that Inclusion WA, in my journey, we can really subscribe to that. Ryan, how do you, how do you be most useful given the sometimes meager resources which you have? Um, and I think it's amazing the, the power work and the broader influence that BeFriend have had. So where I thought I could be useful um, and sit alongside Nick and the great work that he's doing is by talking about the experience that, uh, that I've had working as both a support worker uh, way back in Scotland and then my more recent role working for Inclusion WA for the last, um, on and off the last 10 years in Western Australia. So um, a service provider's perspective on how we could um, support people to live a good life. This part of the series is about life. And um, I'm going to try and share my screen now. And let's see if I can get this to work. So Kate did coach me on this yesterday. So let's see how we go. Okay. Brilliant. Kate, can you see my screen? Okay, so um, so committed are we to this role of trying to support people to live a life of their choosing. We've had this kind of, um, it's, not, it's not a marketing thing, it's more than a marketing thing. We've been uh, working around this mantra for not just living around having a life. So that's quite, a, uh, so this is an extract from our website. So I'm, I'm just proving that life is a big, big idea of supporting people to live a life of their choosing is deeply embedded within the DNA of Inclusion WA. Um, 
So not just living. Uh, what, what we mean by that is, I, I guess it's kind of a pointed statement at potentially, um, and sometimes historically, disability and mental health kind of services have been more focused on keeping people alive and maybe not uh, focusing on a higher, higher aspiration of what a good life like might look like for that person. So not just living a healthy life. And I've been preoccupied with this idea for many years. When I came, uh, I've worked for Inclusion W a couple of times. Uh, I came back because I was tasked with trying to reflect on how we could rethink um, support work in, a, in, a, in an individually funded world, I guess you could call it. And I'd had big ideas. I had a background in community development. I'd also been a support worker um, in, in Glasgow. At the time, I was tasked with working alongside a number of uh, men who lived previously in, in institutions. So any kind of intellectual disability they, they had um, it was kind of overshadowed by the, where they'd been living for a long period of time. I enjoyed the work, but I didn't, uh, I didn't take the work seriously as a career option. This is when I was really young, I was still studying at the time. And part of the reason for that was um, I wasn't afforded an opportunity to really think, to use my brain as a somewhat, um, certainly motivated, switched on kind of person. I was at the time. I wasn't, didn't really take the support work role very seriously because I wasn't afforded an opportunity to think deeply about how it could be most useful in those people's lives. So, and so I've been uh, preoccupied with this idea because I'd read books and big ideas. I knew a bit about um, John and Connie O'Brien's work. I, I bought Simon's book really early on. Uh, when he released the first edition. Um, but I didn't know how to implement this from an organizational perspective. And I thought maybe this is a perspective um, that I'd like to share. So Inclusion WA as a name it obviously suggests a commitment to social inclusion. Um, Nick also has talked a lot about community connection as being important for people. Um, um, so we were obviously committed to the idea of social inclusion and we use the keys to citizenship and Simon's big ideas is one of our guiding principles. John and Connie O'Brien's work, um, other work that we've done uh, with Kate, uh, Leanne, Leanne Pierman, who was on one of the previous sessions, Darren uh, from my place. We've leaned a lot of, on, on some of these other people's big ideas, but when it came to actually implementing this within our own organizations, we didn't have all the answers. The big ideas are useful in terms of they give us some guiding principles around how we could work alongside people. Um, but they didn't tell us how we would actually organize the organization, if you like, in order to do that. And so I guess that's one of the things that I wanted to, to chat about. So Inclusion WA is a good name, I guess, commitment to social inclusion. But what I would really like to call the organization is something slightly different. Um, because in order to help people live a good life or a life that they're choosing, it's really all about thinking uh, and being thoughtful and working flexibly alongside people uh, to help them live that life. Uh, now, that's a very long name for an organization, so we stuck with, we stuck with Inclusion WA. Um, uh, one, of, one of the thoughts I had in preparation for this type of presentation um, was that over the years, one of the things I've learned is that um, it's, it, I think I'm quite well suited for working for an organization, or being a manager type person for an organization like this. And that's because I don't think I'm particularly well suited for management. So bear with me. So what I mean by that is, I think Inclusion WA, one of the things that we do well is we work towards developing some expertise and not being experts in people's lives. So as a, as a general manager of Inclusion WA, which is nothing but a job title, um, what that means to me is, um, is that I don't actually know exactly how we work alongside people. Um, and I think that's a good thing because the way in which we work to empower our uh, I guess frontline 
know, support staff has actually shaped the organization. A long time ago, the reflection I had with a number of the colleagues was, what if, what if we were to, uh, if, if we were to uh, change the way we think about support work so that the role was to do whatever it takes to be as useful as someone's life, then what might happen is that the people we support and their families would actually design the organization for us. And that's been a journey that we've been on now for a number of years. So uh, I, the, what, the point I was trying to make, maybe not very well, the point I was trying to make around not being particularly well suited for management means I don't think I'd be very well suited for a, a, a traditional autocratic um, management type stuff where the key decisions and the knowledge and power is located at the top of the organization because I don't think that works particularly well for disability and mental health services particularly if you're committed to uh, supporting people to live a life of their choosing. Okay, so this next slide is, uh, is uh, one of the um, resources we use for um, inducting new staff into the organization. It's a resource created by a good friend of uh, mine, Heather Simmons. So I guess the service land um, bubble there and uh, in relation to the real world. And it kind of links to what Nick was saying previously, Inclusion WA uh, provide, aspires to provide supports to people in the real world. It acknowledges the, uh, the challenge of segregating people based on what they can't do. And, uh, the, and it also acknowledges the reality of institutionalization of services. And that's not a historical reflection. Uh, these institutions still exist. Um, uh, in relation to Simon's work and the keys to citizenship, uh, we would believe that to be a real active and contributing member of society, you have to be uh, living, loving, working in the real world. So Inclusion WA as an organization aspires to work alongside people in the real world. I guess somewhat of a reflection also. Um, in, in Australia, we have this big government reform process around individualized funding called the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And um, what is happening with that scheme is a, uh, a large increase in the number of people receiving supports um, you know, receiving individualized funding, some of whom, many of whom haven't received any kind of supports in the past. And uh, the basic economics, back of, macroeconomics, supply and demand theory would suggest that what we're going to see in the short term in Australia is not a, um, not a dramatic increase in, in innovative uh, supports, uh, different ways of working alongside people to live a good life for their choosing. Uh, I, I would predict that what we'll actually see is in, an increase in uh, traditional approaches to, to supporting people. So that's just my view. Um, perhaps that sounds quite uh, cynical, but that is what I'm seeing at the moment. And until we see a leveling off of supply and demand, there won't be a huge amount of incentive for um, uh, perhaps quite large service providers to really rethink the way that they're um, working alongside um, people. And I don't believe that the uh, Quality and Safeguarding Commission are going to push those service providers hard enough around uh, really living up to the principles of the scheme because the scheme is so concerned about trying to meet um, targets for the rollout of the NDIS. So that, that's, I guess, what I'm seeing in terms of what's happening in Australia. What I'm concerned about is the perpetuation of the status quo. Uh, that the old world thinking around separating people based on what they can't do isn't going to help lead to a life of their choosing. I think what's needed is a radical rethink in the way in support organizations attempt to be useful in people's lives. Um, and I guess what I hope to do today was just to try and kickstart a conversation about um, how organizations can organize themselves in order to attempt to and not be experts in people's lives and uh, flip the power paradigm upside down. 
organizations have um well the more as a proportionate thing actually the more vulnerable or isolated a person is who's receiving support the more power an organization has over that person and we need to take that power very seriously and acknowledge that that is real uh, so I'm, I'm dipping down now into what maybe sounds a little bit of a negative kind of picture and I, and I do that because I worry about such things. Uh, this next slide I've created mainly for Kate Fulton, as a nod to you Kate. Um, and also off the back of a conversation that I've had many years ago when we did a lot of work with Heather Simmons. Um, I'm, I'm quite a sensitive kind of person as well and I think deeply about why why we as an organization need to exist and I, at different points i've kind of sumped into a bit of a deep um sadness i guess around this idea of if, if these are some of the outcomes that we're seeing around perpetuation of the status quo and separating people based on what they cannot um, do or they find difficult um then where do all the bad people work now this sounds like a really oversimplified question maybe to ask but it's something that really preoccupied me for a long time um, in my journey with Inclusion WA because I never met any bad people. I never met any. Now I, sometimes you'd hear you'd hear some story on the news of something that happened to some folk within an institution or whatever um, but I personally have never met any bad people. I've certainly never met any uh, stormtroopers working in the disability and mental health service industry. The reason I asked the question uh, and, and then give my own answer is because I really don't think that you meet any. I would argue that the, um, the outcomes are in services, potentially not meeting the needs of people, potentially separating them from other people who have a shared common interest um, and more bringing people together based on similar uh, disabilities and what people can't do is a result of organizations being flawed around how they organize themselves and around their willingness to think dif differently. Our journey has to be has been a funny one because we want to we want to we want to give people uh, confidence that we have that we're good at providing support whatever good might look like um, but really when it comes down to it we want to be experts and not be experts in your life. So where do all the bad people work? I haven't, I haven't met any. I just think it's a, maybe um, a lack of willingness to think really differently around how we're useful. That's really the problem. I don't believe that there's any, or certainly many, uh, bad people working in our area of work. Anyway, Kate, I hope you appreciate that slide. So now I want to chat about um, this idea of empowering versus disempowering service architecture. So service architecture is this conversation around um, organizing ourselves to be uh, useful, maybe to work towards a uh, life you're choosing, a life where you're an active citizen, or maybe to work against that. So a long time ago, I started a conversation with an Inclusion WA i am sharing some of these perspectives because all of these things we've done wrong in the past. So I'm not talking on, on, on behalf of anyone other than myself and my experience with Inclusion WA. And I'm trying to be brutally honest about the things that we've got wrong in the hope that that might be useful for some of you who may be on a similar journey. So I'm gonna run through a number of things around how we've organized the organization to work um, towards more of a person-centered way of thinking. Um, so here we go. So this first one is around how we uh, 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 maybe recruit or maybe uh, roster our supports. So uh, quite a long time ago, one of the key things that helped change the culture of inclusion W is moving away from rosters. Uh, the rostering of staff was traditionally done by a centralized unit, sort of like a coordinator type role or an administrative kind of person. And that was problematic because the person who was organizing the support staff didn't actually know the person. They didn't make decisions about what time of day they were working or what goals they were going to even work on. And what that was creating was a disempowering franchise 
that landed on the person who was receiving support. So when we started to change uh, things internally and move away from uh, sh scheduling of supports by people that didn't know the individual, so that really started to free up the organization. What we then learned was the way that we were doing things previously was almost like this. I talk about disempowering service architecture. Uh, the way that we had worked in the past was actually resulting in us employing all the wrong type of people because all the wrong types of people wanted to be given the answer. Where really what we wanted is staff, support staff to think deeply and to work flexibly alongside the person that they should be getting to know. And that's really started to change things within our organization. At Inclusion W these days, the way that work is scheduled is a negotiation between the support person, who we call a mentor, and the, um, and the individual who's receiving support. So uh, this next one is really linked to the way in which we moved away from roster. We also moved away from um, delivery of prescriptive programs. In the past, in Inclusion uh, had a, had a uh, was well known around providing uh, what we called community inclusion services. And part of the problem with that was we would meet someone, we would build a relationship of trust, and then that person would ask us something like, so um, at the, we, we would learn that the priority at that point in time for that uh, person was uh, not to join a local uh, cricket club, but it was to get a job. And we would say to that person, oh, I'm sorry, we only do community inclusion work. You know, we're really good at inc community inclusion work and we can help you get connected with your community, but we can't, we can't help you find a job. So this was, this was an agency-centered approach that was a consequence of structuring the organization around programs and not around the person. Uh, fast forward to these days, the way we've organized and structured ourselves is that um, we have geographically located um, teams who, are, who have a lot of autonomy to uh, be useful to people in lots of different ways. We don't just receive um, funding plans from a government agency and do what's in the plan. We will we will try and uh, respond to being useful uh, in a way that reflects the priorities of that person at that given point in time. And we find that to be more effective than structuring the organisation around prescriptive programmes. Okay, traditional approaches or uh, certainly the way that it, we had worked in the past uh, we, around employing the wrong types of staff, we'd also uh, realized that we were disempowering our frontline staff and that was the opposite of what I would call a customer services architecture. So one of my reflections around this, remember at the time I had already had all these um, bit, of, bit of knowledge and understanding around uh, the big ideas, citizenship, social inclusion, uh, via social roles through SRV training and things like that. So I didn't really know yet how to organize ourselves. So one of my reflections was thinking about other types of businesses that were not disability and mental health service providers and thinking about their, their, uh, their uh, structure of providing uh, more of a customer service kind of architecture and wondering what would customer services look like for people who are uh, vulnerable, sometimes really isolated, uh, sometimes living in really complex uh, situations. So I actually leaned on different types of businesses to reflect on how we would try and empower the frontline staff. Because even my, even my local uh, coffee shop next to work, one of the things that they do really well is invest, invest a lot in training on their frontline staff. Um, and then they attempt to get the, the best staff to stick around for a long time. Um, and they'll provide career pathways where those frontline staff can, um, uh, can go and further their uh, career by being specialists and still being frontline staff. And I think this is something that all types of organizations um, do badly, where um, you know, career progression looks like becoming a line manager or some type of administrative role. And disability and mental health services 
And we don't do this perfectly either within Inclusion WA, but we're on a bit of a journey to try and create more, um, more um, path, career pathways where you can take on more responsibility, attract better salaries and so on, uh, by being uh, just a really experienced, well-qualified uh, support person. So we wanted to move away from what I call an agency centre approach where we have low expectations for the frontline staff um, another thing about this, a, a conversation with a friend of mine who, who became really uh, disenchanted working within a number of large, uh, large group homes in Perth. Um, one of the reflections I had chatting to him was, when you get this wrong, when you get this really wrong, what, what it creates is a culture where the organisation is encouraging all the wrong types of people to work there. And if you're the right sort of person that should be providing really good, positive support, support, a great listener, great combination of emotional intelligence and intellect, you know, a really good uh, support person, you are considered a troublemaker uh, within that organization by suggesting different ways in which you can be useful, the way in which you organize someone's living arrangements or you know, reflect, you know, work on some priority that they have those staff are often considered um, you have to be troublemakers within those organizations. So I think when you get this wrong, you can accidentally encourage all the wrong sorts of people to work for your organization. If you get it right, the, your frontline staff are not only, only empowered, but there are consequences that your, um, the people you support, your clients, your families, they actually start to design the organization for you. And I find that really, uh, really exciting and very positive. Here's a, here's a, this is a personal reflection from Cleveland WA, so uh, don't take this personally if your organization is invest, heavily invested in owning lots of fixed assets and things. But from our perspective, um, uh, working alongside people to live a life of their choosing also meant uh, reducing the amount of fixed assets that we uh, owned. Um, our future is not in uh, owning a lot of buildings, um, certainly not owning um, day centres or, 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 or group homes. We don't own a lot of vehicles, um, so we'll come up with different ways in which we try and minimise our uh, fixed asset expenses. This also includes um, management, management people. Um, I would consider management people like myself to be a, a fixed asset uh, in a way. Um, so we try and reduce so our management and fixed asset overhead so that we can invest more heavily in the front line uh, because we're at the end of the day we're only as good as the uh, as the, our frontline staff essentially so one of the things that we've learned in our journey is to really try and work away from acquiring uh, a lot of uh, fixed assets uh, this one really is about the point of, i've probably made it already um, that within Inclusion WA, and I'll often say, it, is that we're only as good as the support uh, people, our mentors who work for the organisation. I truly believe this. Um, it doesn't. Um, it, this also puts pressure on the recruitment process. Um, it puts pressure on uh, management around how we invest our uh, sometimes meagre kind of resources that we have. And I, for me, this shows really high expectations for the role of a support worker. Uh, we've kind of really lived and breathed this for a long time to the point where all of our um, uh, middle senior management type positions are occupied by people who were previously um, a mentor, a support uh, person. So really, really excellent support people because good leadership at the end of the day is actually really similar to uh, good support to stand beside to stand behind and sometimes to stand in front you learn a lot uh, about leadership by thinking about what good support looks like and this next one is i'm i'm gonna I, i've only got a few more of these to go so i, I hope you're still with me um, and, and then there's, these aren't in any particular order. It's just more of a, a brain dump, really. Um, this next one's a really important one for me. This is around knowledge and power. 
So one of the one part, one of the key reflections in our journey at Inclusion WA is that if we if we recognise that knowledge and power is better located as close to our uh, clients, the people, families we support, then we're then we're also doing a better job of transferring more power to those people. So typically, and this is how Inclusion WA way back was structured, a lot of the key decision making was centralised within um, a, within a small number of people within the organisation. Even things like um, training and induction of new staff. So when I talk about centralization of knowledge versus decentralization of knowledge and decision making power, for me, I think this is one of the key transformational changes that we made at Inclusion WA, and we're still on that journey. Our journey towards creating geographical hubs, which are responsible for their own um, uh, they're responsible for their own recruitment, but also responsible for their understanding their own um, financial sustainability. So we've trained over time, we've trained up um, so former support people to understand um, the business side of the organization as well, so that they're uh, much more informed to make the good decisions themselves around how they want to organize themselves. But increasingly, what I'm finding as we become more removed from some of the action uh, within our service hub is that they have so much autonomy that, um, you know, uh, we even have examples of people developing new types of approaches to supporting people or trying to understand real focus areas in which we can be useful in people's lives, taking more responsibility for their own professional and personal development. And this, uh, so I get, I guess through this, you, you'll get the picture of empower, what I call empowering service architects. Uh, knowledge is power, and so knowledge located as close to the front line as possible for me is a must have with any disability and mental health service provider. Um, one of the big things uh, we talked about our guiding principles and inclusion WA, of which uh, the keys to citizenship is one. Ultimately, um, inclusion WA, as the name may, may suggest, I'm not sure if it's suggested. Um, but we want to we want to try and help uh, support the people to become uh, more independent of our supports. Uh, we're not paid friends. Uh, we we have that that's a really strong thing. Plus, we have a quite a strong idea around professional uh, uh, boundaries. Um, we want to our, our work is to facilitate connections between the person we're supporting and the other people that they choose to spend time with. Maybe a neighbour, a family member, or someone with a shared interest, and so on. So a key thing for us is not to create a dependency on on paid supports, because often that can lead to people becoming uh, more isolated. In WA, we still have lots of examples of um, people with disability only being surrounded by paid uh, support staff, often who work only for one organisation, and they. Those people, I would argue, are potentially some of the most vulnerable people in the state uh, because they're solely surrounded by paid supports and all uh, from the same provider. So through some of these examples, my random um, pick and mix of how we've organised ourselves at Inclusion WA, I hope you get a bit of feel around um, the culture or at least the culture we we're aspiring to around this um, non-traditional hierarchical approach. My, one of my reflections a long time ago, working alongside Heather and even uh, Kate, uh, was that um, if, if disability and mental health service providers design themselves and have a culture that, uh, that echoes a government agency, uh, then you're not going to get great outcomes for people. Uh, you're not going to have empowered uh, frontline staff who are encouraged to think deeply around what their role is in your, your life. And in, in the worst case, you're actually going to encourage all the wrong types of people uh, to work there. So there, there's a handful of uh, reflections around um, how um, our journey, I guess, around supporting people to live a life of their choosing. And what Nick and I wanted to do next was really um, um, uh, turn this a bit more into a Q&A kind of session, or maybe you could share some of your own perspectives around how you've organized your 
organizations or maybe uh, lessons learned, things that have worked. Or you maybe even have some questions for me around how uh, some of the points that I've raised here as well. If you remember back to the start of the presentation, Nick asked the question, how could we work differently with people and with community to assist people to live life as active citizens? So from my perspective, working towards a life of your choosing, not against it. And I think that's been such a huge part of our journey. Um, um, so now I'm going to throw that out for broader discussion from, from, from the group. Um, and we'll see, we'll see where we go. Richard, could you just stop sharing your screen, please, so we can just see everybody and see if oh, there's... Yeah. Um... Oh, good, yeah, there we go. That's cool, thank you. Okay, anybody want to go first? Anybody got, want to jump in? I've got loads of stuff going on, but... Uh... Silvana? Uh, thank you, um, both Nick and um, Richard. That was, that was really interesting. I really enjoyed your presentations for different reasons. I'm not going to summarise what I think's um, my light bulb moments there, um, but certainly being a contribution versus making a contribution really stood out for me. Thank you. I would like to just say something in relation to your invitation, Richard, in terms of what works in terms of um, getting organisations to help people towards working towards a life of their choosing, not against it. Uh, we had a real turnaround here in uh, this organization, uh, organization. We work with parents of very little children, birth to eight years old. And we, we've uh, found oh, what, what really has made a tremendous difference is um, building family leadership and employing trained family members as peer workers in our workplace. And in the last two and a half years, we've trained 20 family members who um, are um, as peer workers who work in different ways in the organization. And uh, one of the most significant uh, impacts of this has been that um, I, I think you had a very nice phrase, um, get the right people uh, working with you because they'll help design the services for you. Um, or you might've said, get the relationship right with the people you're working with and they'll help you design the services. But what, what, it is is that these are parents of little children. They're still our customer base. They, they, everything that we're doing is still really highly relevant and important to them. And now that they're peer workers, they've got confidence to tell us what would be better and how we can do things better to meet their needs. And seeing, seeing how confident they are to tell us how we can change what we're offering or how we're doing things is a, a, a huge, a huge positive. Um, getting people to be honest and confident enough to tell you where you can improve is just wonderful. And then just running with those ideas wherever you can and, and wherever possible involving them. So both, both of your conversations today are really important. So thank you very much. Thanks, Silvana. I had a question for you around the family leadership side of things. How do you find, um, so I'm assuming you've, you've got a combination of staff working for your organisation, uh, some of whom are, you mentioned, uh, parents or family members of people with disability. Um, how do you find, uh, I'm gonna, maybe I'm being a bit picky, but just around the professional, sort of personal boundaries side of things, how do those staff find kind of drawing a line between uh, work and home kind of life? Uh, the, so just if you could just clarify your question, is it about how the existing staff, so our organisation is predominantly up until two years ago, made up of therapists and early childhood uh, special educators. And uh, we went from being about 50 people on the team of those kinds of people. And now we're 70 people with sort of potentially, you know, between 15 and 20 peer workers. So they've, been in a, they've made a substantial impact. Did you mean how did those peer workers, how, did, how were they embraced by the non-peer work staff? Or do you mean how, do, uh, how does a family member who's now a peer worker navigate their role 
doing that during the day and being a parent of a child with a disability at night? I just wasn't sure what the question was. Um, the second part, just navigating the role as a paid, uh, you know, yeah. paid professional capacity, but then also, also yeah. you're actually in it at, at that point in time. Uh, is that, does that work? Um, yeah. Well, are there any challenges with that? Or Yeah. So um, we've done a small study with Sydney University to look at this. So we invited the peer workers to be a part of the study and we looked at what is the impact of peer work on the peer workers themselves and overwhelmingly it it uh, mirrors the example and experience of peer workers in the mental health sector in that greater empower, empowerment um, you know more experience and knowledge uh, increase in confidence um, very sort of um, of course there's the employment issue for families of little children getting them back into the workforce more quickly perhaps than what they would have and perhaps taking them on a pathway into another direction from their previous careers. And that can be interesting for those individuals because they say things like, I can't imagine going back to my previous career now. You know, after the experience that I've had, I can't imagine going back to that career now. I feel like I want to do something to support other families with this. So a sort of a stronger meaning, uh, sense of meaning and purpose uh, for, for those who... Um, who have responded to the research um, in, in the first instance. I suppose if, if it doesn't work, then people don't want to become a paid peer worker. So some families have said they're ident you know, they don't want their child's disability to identify or disability to, uh, to, um, to, um, to be their identity. And, uh, and that's fair enough too. So those families um, tap in and do other things and, and don't do paid peer work, but linking to what um, uh, Nick said in his first presentation, that's where getting those parents to contribute to freely to build your community and to build that community of parents for parents. Not everybody has to be paid. I thought that was a beautiful explanation um, that you made, Nick. Really, really enjoyed that. Can I just add uh, from my experience with uh, training the peer workers that Silvana talks about, what they keep saying is the more they work and the more content and knowledge they gain, the better they, say they feel as parenting the children and the better they, f the more confident they feel in their children's future because they feel that the knowledge that they gain and that they share during their peer worker roles um, is immediately relevant to their lives. So that connection is an, almost an organic connection, but um, m you know, they, from what I've seen, they report it as incredibly enriching. But as Silvana said, not everyone is suited for that. So it could be that there is a, cell, a little bias of the people go, drawn to this work, um, you know, like more or keen, more able to um, adapt this knowledge into their personal life. I don't want to make a, a, a generalization here, but what we have seen is that they report that it's enriched their life. Uh, as, as in, in terms of the knowledge they gained. Thanks, Anik. Anybody else? Where's your thinking going? Bev? Thank you very much, both of you, for your incredible um, presentations, given me a lot to think about. Um, so where I'm going with this is, um, in terms of um, not just living a life, but having a life. Because in today's society, with the um, immense amount of, of, of suicides and, and depression and anxiety, um, I just feel that sometimes we overlook seeing a person in an environment where we think those people are doing well, but we don't always stop to think about what is it about that person that's not, it's about inclusion for me. It's about hospitality. Sorry, I'm going all over the place in my mind. So I might appear to be a bit mixed up, but in my mind, I know where I'm coming from. If a person, um, from a personal level, you come in from a foreign country, you come to a new, a new country and you know no one, you're alone. 
you're excluded until you make a contribution and people then believe that you can actually um, contribute to a society, to a community. I just feel very often, um, and having um, had an experience with my dad, um, who lived his life, but he didn't have a life. Um, I'm going to get emotional now. Sorry, that's why I'm all over the show. But I really appreciate um, what we all do to include people in, in a society and a community and the work that we all do. And thank you for that. Sorry. That's okay, Beth. Thank you. Steve, Bridget, have you got any comments you want to make? Bridget? Yeah. Sorry, who's going for Steve? You're on. Okay, yeah. I mean, I suppose, um, yeah, it, it, it's a bit of a bit of a unhappy reflection, really, that I think that um, certainly in the UK in the 80s and the 90s, we've been able to do some of the things that um, we've been talking about today. But increasingly, I think that those things have now got caught up in the kind of notions of new public management in which you appear to be able to um, do some of those things about frontline staff being able to change things but in reality that is becoming actually much more difficult for them to do that, that be because of the contracting it down and assigning them to those roles uh, in in a way that is alleged to be more accountable to the service users, but actually isn't. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does to me, Steve. Sorry, only you okay? I, 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 it just really resonates with me, Steve. One of the things that is really kind of screaming loudly in my head is um, a, a kind of. So when we talk about support support providers, are we? kind of um, government contractors who deliver a government service, yeah. which co with all of that crap comes all of the stuff like Richard said before, that if actually we're exactly. going to be hit by government. So I suppose that's probably the bit that um, is just so loud, listening to both of you, that it's so easy to become an organisation that is purely focused on delivering government services. Whereas I think that it links to that thing about where are all the bad people. I, I don't think most of us came in this work to be deliverers yeah. of government services. So, yeah. so there's something for me about the power of organisations doing what they think they should be doing, not necessarily. And, and can they do both? I don't know. Because I suppose what, what you were saying then, Steve, was talking a lot to that question about can you do both and what would that look like? So I really appreciate what you said. It, it certainly really resonated. Yeah, Steve, Steve, can I just add something really quickly? Mm. Um, so what we find with the way in which funding is allocated now um, in, in, in Australia through the NDIS is that the, we're, we're, we are limited by the way that the um, funding is allocated um, through a price guide. And the price guide is based on traditional approaches to supporting people. So it's easy for organizations like Inclusion WA to hide behind a price guide and avoid doing certain types of work because we're only funded to do X, Y, and Z. But what I've noticed, the organizations I think that are most interesting uh, and, and, and arguably most useful are the ones who are willing to walk the line. You, know, walk, you, 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 you equate to the person you're supporting, not to the government agency. The, the old world of grant-based funding saw Inclusion WA being led around like a cart and a horse, um, doing government projects and delivering programs and having places. Um, the, the, the neat thing about an individually funded world is it does create the right power dynamic between the, having to equip to the person and their family, because they're the ones you really have to um, uh, be most useful too, and the organisations who are willing to work, walk the line, um, you know, not not necessarily do exactly what's in the, um, you know, all the T's and C's within the government um, 
agreement in in order to be as useful as possible in someone's life. I, I think they're the they're the organisations that are worth um, chatting to. Thanks, Richard. I'm just going to go to Bridget because there's Bridget wants to say something, and then Anik is, wants to say something. I think. Um, yeah. Thanks, Nick and Richard. That was again, you know, makes your brain kind of fizz with all sorts of things to think about. I guess the bit that I, I and mean, even you mentioned it before, Richard, is that notion where we are at CamCam recruiting people around building a relationship and that stuff that you were talking about, Nick, around standing um, with somebody and I guess promoting them and and, um, and supporting them to get be engaging in communities of the things that they're passionate about. So we're kind of doing that recruiting and I think that part we're doing very well. But what we're not doing so well is when we're taking people and they're not aware of their boundaries, I guess. And so that kind of all of a sudden they're sitting there and they are are replacing friendships or they're not since we're not quite getting there we kind of I feel for us we kind of part way through that process and how to have a boundary conversation when we're talking about great relationship and contribution is with limited training time is is really tricky yeah thanks Bridget Anik Thanks. So, sorry, it doesn't really relate to what Bridget was saying before, but uh, more to what um, the, w to the discussion about the role of service providers as organisations. And I, I, I maybe I've missed a whole lot of literature on on this topic. Uh, and if I have, please don't point me to it. But take if I take a step backwards, it really is the role of community development to open up arms to everybody in the community. It's just that they haven't traditionally. So they've said, okay, we develop, we um, um, in, um, um, welcome everyone uh, apart from dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so for instance, Silvana is an example of uh, having to make 20 phone calls just to get her son registered in a, martial art uh, because as soon as they heard that he has a disability then they said no no that, that, that won't fit so and that's there's like multiple examples everywhere of all these so-called community development organizations who are not accepting people with disability but um, I think that it would pay to explore the extent to which uh, our sector the the disability sector could maybe partner with some of these community development organization, maybe someone with a progressive, uh, you know, like you have an early adopter in certain field and maybe work so that, so that that happens on the other side also. So it's not just the disability sector moving in, one, to the, in the direction of community and, you know, say, you know, please include us, please include us. But actually, because uh, at the moment, I feel that as we're doing this, we're not finding really um, um, much, we don't have much success with community organization opening their arms to say, yes, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people. I'm sure that there are people and that they would people more being more progressive. In that case, wouldn't it, would, would we have good examples of organizations, service providers who cater to people who with disability or their parents, making, uh, establishing strong partnerships with community organizations so that the grounds for citizenship uh, um, is there more naturally than having a one-on-one -on -one approach and of course I'm not saying we shouldn't have a one-on-one -on -one. it's definitely a one on um, very much so one-on-one -on -one because you have to you know each person's life is very different so we don't want to say that everyone needs the same solution at all that's not what I'm saying but I'm just saying are there good examples of uh, research where a disability service provider has made a really good partnership with a community organization and they're working together and so there is this intentionality, but it's not just, okay, we'll get you in because you have a disability, but now we just accept everyone. So do you know, does anyone know about examples like this? Richard, do you, do you want to say anything about inclusion solutions? Um, well, like, firstly, I'd like to talk just quickly about Inclusion WA and what we consider good support work. Um, the groundwork that you talk about um, makes me think around the importance of um, indirect support. So the work behind the scenes to prepare an environment so someone can feel welcome is part of good support. So support work is also community development work, uh, as I would argue it. 
for the groundwork you do with you know doing the research with the person around what community groups might be um, worth a try and then trying to work out an approach an approach to approaching that community group is an important part of um, good support work at inclusion wa um, so the reason I mentioned the group structure and, and our sister organization inclusion solutions earlier on because inclusion solutions does that um, work alongside um, community groups and that could include employers of people with disability to get them to think more um, carefully around how they could be welcoming of uh, people with say intellectual disability or helping someone with mental health issue return to work so they'll try and do that awareness raising capacity building work with the community group uh, and then uh, paving the way for uh, more people to get involved in that community group in, in, in the future but i think the main reflection around what you're saying is um good support work is also about um as nick put it i think he talked about building a, a ramp like we can being that community connector um to um to to approach that community group to prepare the scene if you like so that someone's chance of feeling included are much more increased and i, I would consider that to be good support work thanks richard so you're st still seeing it as one one at a time uh, whereas my question was more to ask if there was if we knew of a not of, of, a, of a good example of like a, a strong partnership between organizations you're uh, saying it's the it's the individual work of support. Yeah, I mean, I know I'm that. Say, I'm saying yeah. I'm saying we need to do both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. It, it, for many years, inclusion solutions would have worked alongside Western Australian Football Association, or more recently, mm -hmm. they were given an award by um, the National Body for Cricket in Australia around creating more welcoming uh, cricket clubs, various things like that. So no, I think it's right attacking the same issue but from different angles. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Nick, very quickly, we've got like a couple of minutes. Yeah, I know we're, we're pretty short on time, but um, I thought I might just kind of uh, respond to your, your comments as well. And they, um, because it's, uh, I think it's a really interesting question about what would this sort of partnership between community organization and service provider look like. It's, um, it's one that I've thought quite a lot about and we've within our context, we've actually kind of really explored, been exploring that with Avivo over the last sort of five years or so. Um, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's hard to relay that really quickly, but it, I think all I just want to express is that um, I think there's potential there, but it's really challenging. Um, I think that it kind of requires this real empathy of both contexts and maybe something around like more strategic conversations about a, what, what a really intentional partnership might look like. Um, whilst also appreciating that in those two different contexts, both organisations um, have different types of constraints. Um, and a lot of that comes from the funding model. Um, and so I think there's a real question for me around what, what does the resourcing or the funding model look like that would make that type of collaboration possible? Uh, I think that as, as kind of Richard was kind of picking up on quite nicely, I think there's also a risk with that type of partnership though as well of almost this form of lazy integration where it, where, where that one or that one community organization is seen as the go-to place for supporting people on the fringes um, rather than sort of seeing the abundance in, in so many different community spaces and looking at how support workers can explore that with people in all kinds of different contexts. So yeah. There's lots in that really challenging. Um, I think there's possibility there. Um, I think we need to kind of start with that empathy from the, the different contexts though. Thanks, Nick. I'm going to bring us to a close. Um, thank you, thank you, Richard and Nick, you know, as, as ever, a brilliant, brilliant session. Um, loads to think about. I wish we had the rest of the day to sit and drink tea and keep talking about it. Um, but I know that uh, we need to go. So I know we've lost Silvana. Uh, Silvana did email me and she's um, given me a link to a document that she said would be really helpful to carry on this conversation. So I'll post that in to the uh, website and the social media link uh, with the film. So that if you want to have a bit of a read of that, she's definitely recommended it. So it's worth having a look at.
Um, our next session is on the 20th of June, and that is focused on the key law. And we have Dave Hinsberger, who's going to join us. So if you haven't met Dave before or heard Dave's perspective, um, brace yourself and get ready. Uh, he is a fabulous um, thought provoker. Um, Okay, I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much, Nick and Richard, again. Thank you, everybody, for your contribution, um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.